lecture series on regional dynamics. So uh, this is a, a regular program for us. So we try at least every month to conduct this um, lecture on issues related to uh, international relations, um, foreign policy, and basically the, the dynamics in the region of, of the Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific, as some would prefer to say it these days. Um, this afternoon, we have the honor um, to have Professor Anne-Marie Murphy with us. Uh, professor Murphy is a professor of School of Diplomacy and International Relations of the Seton Hall University. And she is currently here in Jakarta, based at CSIS, as a Fulbright ASEAN Research Program Scholar. So indeed a, uh, a pleasure for us to um, have her with us almost one month, or has it been more than a month? It's been a month, so it's, um, it's always been a, uh, it's been a pleasure for us to, to host her at CSIS. Um, we asked Professor Murphy um, to share with us today some of her thoughts regarding basically um, U.S.-Indonesia relations, but more specifically on the U.S. free and open Indo-Pacific and the implications for Southeast Asia and Indonesia. So um, basically, you know, I I us in Indonesia, in Southeast Asia, we feel that the, the competition between U.S. and China, you know, the whole uh, geopolitical um, dynamics um, has had a great impact on Southeast Asia and um, including Indonesia. So it's always um, interesting to try to elaborate more, um, at least from the U.S. point of view, what are you know the the new policy, if, if there are any, uh, with regards to this ongoing competition between the U.S. and China. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, invite Professor Murphy to give her remarks. Better? There we go. All right. Well, thank you very much. Oh. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Shafia Muhibat, for that very kind introduction. I'd like to thank um, the executive director of CSIS, Dr. Phillips Vermonti, for um, hosting me here at uh, CSIS, as well as all of the researchers who've really made this uh, a second home for me over the last month. I want to thank the Fulbright ASEAN Research Program for funding my scholarship and getting me to Indonesia in the first place, and to everybody at the MNF team who uh, really facilitated the trip. And last but not least, I really want to thank all of you for braving Jakarta traffic to come here today. I'm really looking forward to engaging with you in the Q&A. So, my talk is on the U.S. Free and Open Indo-Pacific implications for Southeast Asia. Um, may I have the next slide, please? So the first thing I want to do is just give you a very brief outline of my talk, um, obviously so that we can understand what the Free and Open Indo-Pacific built upon. The first thing I want to do is discuss Obama's rebalance or pivot to Asia to provide the background. Second thing I want to do is talk about the changing U.S. views of China uh, between the period of, say, 2011 when Obama announced his rebalance to Trump's taking office in 2016. Um, I then want to talk about Trump's transactional foreign policy, which sets the context within which the free and open Indo-Pacific developed. I then want to talk about the strategy itself, the extent to which it's really a strategy or a set of principles that really embody a vision. I want to talk about the implications for Southeast Asia, which, as uh, Dr. Fifi noted, is really significantly increased competition between the U.S. and China. And I want to talk about some of the strategic options that Southeast Asian states have, and then the implications for Indonesia and prospects for change in U.S. policy. Okay? Next slide, please. So, I want to start from the observation that the Obama rebalance policy was designed to redress a key concern of Southeast Asia, which is about the U.S. commitment to the region. Since the U.S. withdrew after the Vietnam War, that has always been a key concern of Southeast Asian countries regarding the U.S., and the pivot was designed to redress that. The pivot was based on a strategic assessment that global power was shifting to the Indo-Pacific region that U.S. foreign policy under Obama's predecessor Bush had been too focused on the Middle East, the global war on terror, and it needed to be refocused to Asia, which is home to key uh, U.S. allies, major trading partners, and key security uh, challenges such as North Korea. 
Now, the pivot was multifaceted, and this multifacetedness was designed to address another criticism uh, by Southeast Asian states of U.S. policy, which is that it tends to focus too much on the security issues to the neglect of other issues, particularly economics, which are vitally important to Southeast Asia. Therefore, when we look at the pivot, yes, there was a security component. The pivot hoped to strengthen U.S. alliances and partnerships. It aimed to redeploy 60 percent of U.S. naval assets from, uh, or excuse me, 60 percent to Asia. Uh, it had been 50 percent in the past. This would be a redeployment again from the Middle East to Asia to rotate 2,500 Marines through Darwin Air Base in um, Singapore to devote new naval placements uh, uh, in Singapore as well. So this was the security side. On the economic side, the key component was the TPP or the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This was a free trade area that the U.S. argued was a gold standard. It was going to govern not just trade issues but IPR services, et cetera, and really promote integration uh, going forward. Um, and there was also a multilateral component, which was to embrace ASEAN-led regional architecture. The U.S. under Obama signed ASEAN's um, Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. It joined the East Asian Summit. It appointed the first resident ambassador to ASEAN. And Obama backed up this component of the pivot with the most pr precious commodity that any U.S. president has, which is his time. Obama showed up to ASEAN. Throughout his eight-year um, term, he showed up seven times. So this was a key emphasis for ASEAN. So for this, Southeast Asian countries, I would argue, largely welcomed the pivot, even if some claimed it didn't live up to its hype because it, A, evidenced a uh, commitment by the U.S. to play its traditional offshore balancer role, it had the economic component, and it enhanced ASEAN centrality. It helped maintain an overall balance of power in the region at a time when China was rising and raising concerns among smaller states. Now, if we ask about U.S.-Chinese relations during this point, we see a mixed pattern of cooperation and conflict, but the fundamental assumption underlying U.S.-China relations at this point was that even though China was, and this is a quote from Xi Jinping, right, growing rich, growing strong, that it had become rich and strong under a liberal global order, and therefore China had a stake in helping to preserve that order. So the assumption in Washington was that China would ultimately work to revise this system from within, not challenge it from without. And that had been the consensus among U.S. policymakers since the opening to China in the 70s, okay? May I have the next slide, please? So what changed? In the period uh, between, say, 2011 or the Obama's pivot, then moving on to 2016, you see that China took a range of actions across different issue areas that really began, or sorry, began to question uh, this assumption that China was committed to a peaceful rise. In the South China Sea, as you all know, China proclaimed this nine-dash line map. Uh, it claimed 90 percent of the South China Sea, justified it according to some ambiguous historical issues rather than the U and the law of sea. And from the U.S. perspective, this amounted to an attempt to privatize the global commons, and it threatened freedom of navigation. Um, China's seizure of Scarborough Shoal in 2012 from the Philippines illustrated that China was willing to use force to achieve its objectives. We then saw artificial island building in the South China Sea. Um, and then in 2015, President Xi stood with President Obama at the White House, and he promised Obama that China would not militarize these artificial islands. Since then, as you all know, 
China has constructed airfields, port facilities, it's built hangars for fighter planes, etc. That has essentially created forward operating bases from which China can project power far from its shores. And I want to emphasize that this fact that President Xi blatantly lied to Obama really generated a strong sense of betrayal and mistrust among policymakers um, in Washington that really triggered a reassessment of uh, Chinese intentions and words. When we look at other issue areas, we have trade concerns, China using non-tariff uh, barriers, other issues, cyber espionage. And then we also have China during this period creating the Belt and Road Initiative, announcing the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which were seen in Washington as challenges to Western-led institutions such as the World Bank and the IMF. So I want to make the point that even before Trump's election, there were perceptions based on Chinese actions about how China was going to use its power and the threat that China's actions and intentions posed to U.S. interests that would probably have led to some type of policy change regardless of who was elected in 2016. But as we all know, President Trump was elected. May I have the next slide, please? Um, and Trump adopts a, what he calls, American first, very transactional foreign policy. Um, Trump, within days of coming to office, withdraws from the TPP. And this was a huge blow, particularly to certain Southeast Asian countries like Malaysia and Vietnam, where reformers had really stuck their neck out to lobby their governments to sign this agreement. And it raises questions again about the lack of U.S. commitment. As you all know, Trump then declares a trade war with China. I don't need to tell an audience in Indonesia that this has disrupted global uh, trade and supply chains and reduced forecasts for economic growth across the world. Um, we also see under Trump a really aggressive focus on countries with which the U.S. has trade deficits. As you all know, Indonesia is on a list of 16 countries uh, that the U.S. has the greatest trade deficits with thus far. Trump has not paid that much attention to Indonesia. That's a good thing in this case, um, but you never know if he will. Trump has also taken an extremely um, strong stance on generalized uh, general specialized trading preferences, or GSP. These are rules that allow um, imports from uh, developing countries into the U.S. at lower tariffs. Uh, the U.S. recently uh, closed those down for India, ditto for Thailand, and the U.S. is currently considering uh, whether or not to extend GSP in Indonesia. So we see a very um, hard stance on some of these economic issues from which uh, Southeast Asian countries have traditionally benefited. We see that Trump also abandons Obama's embrace of ASEAN. Trump did attend the two, uh, 2017 meeting. 2018, he sent Vice President Trump 2019, he sent a very low-level delegation, not even a cabinet member, uh, to the ASEAN meetings in Bangkok, which was interpreted as a sign of disrespect. So the point I want to make is that we see in this transactional foreign policy a shift away from the pivot, particularly from the economic and the multilateral embrace of ASEAN, the components of the pivot that were most welcome in Southeast Asia. So within that, what's the free and open Pacific? If Obama's pivot was based on a very strategic assessment of changes in global economic and power shifts, then I want to make the point that I think we can say that the pivot is very much a reaction to 
Chinese policy. Did I say pivot? I meant free and open Indo-Pacific. It's a response to Chinese actions, particularly on the South China Sea and issues related to the BRI. These would be, of course, a perception that many of the BRI projects were corrupt, that they enriched elites who benefited from taking cuts of the deals that then led to unsustainable debt levels that had to be repaid on the basis of citizen taxpayers who didn't benefit from uh, the corruption, or as in the Sri Lankan case, where when Sri Lanka was unable to repay its Belt and Road loans, it handed over the strategically located um, Hambantoa port to China on a 99-year lease. So this raised the perception in Washington, BRI was not simply an economic mechanism to promote infrastructure development and connectivity, but also the use of economic statecraft for strategic purposes, okay? So with that in mind, when we look at the free and open Indo-Pacific, again, it's this contrast with China. From the U.S. perspective, it's free. That means freedom from coercion as opposed to China's use of force in the South China Sea. Freedom of navigation as opposed to what many believe is Chinese intent to impose an anti-access area denial strategy and require permission for transit through key parts of the South China Sea. It is a rules-based order rather than a might makes right order based on power, uh, and it's free trade uh, rather than predatory economics and debt trap diplomacy. Uh, so that is how it's being pitched. And we see that U.S. Secretary of State Pompeo, in a speech clearly directed at a Southeast Asian audience, said, and I quote, we are committed to upholding a free and open Indo-Pacific in which all nations, large and small, are secure in their sovereignty and able to pursue economic growth consistent with international law and principles of fair competition. So if you take that speech and you look at some of these characteristics, you can say, gee, the principles of the free and open Indo-Pacific are largely congruent with those of ASEAN in the interests of Southeast Asian states. ASEAN does want a Southeast Asia free of coercion. Southeast Asians trade dependent countries do want freedom of navigation. Southeast Asia small and medium sized countries also do prefer a rules based order rather than one based on power. Um, and most want free trade. That said, ASEAN is clearly uncomfortable with the free and open Indo-Pacific for a number of reasons. First, in the U.S. National Security Strategy of 2017, in which the uh, Trump administration first really began to talk about the Indo-Pacific, it labeled China a peer competitor. Um, and uh, in the 2018 National Defense Strategy, it claimed that China's aim was to establish hegemony and to displace the U.S. from the Indo-Pacific region. So that from an ASEAN perspective then, the Indo-Pacific strategy aimed to compete with China and they did not want to be drawn into choosing sides. Second, the free and open Indo-Pacific was announced almost simultaneously with the revival of the Quad, the US-Australia-India-Japanese strategic dialogue. So to many Southeast Asian states, this raised the prospect of larger outside powers governing what was happening within their home territory. Um, and moreover then, although U.S. officials have tried to respond to this fear by saying that the free and open Indo-Pacific uh, recognizes ASEAN centrality, these verbal reassurances have not gone very far. So, uh, and then finally, ASEAN was a bit concerned over the free and open Indo-Pacific because when it was originally announced, it was this kind of vision of principles, much less a strategy to achieve them. 
And so when we look then at what the U.S. has done to attempt to translate this vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific into a strategy, what do we see? With freedom of navigation, that's clearly the key U.S. interest, right, in Southeast Asia, freedom of navigation through these waters. We see that the tool that it uses most is freedom of navigation exercises. The U.S., as many of you may have heard, asserts its right to fly, sail, and operate wherever international law applies through these operations which challenge what the U.S. views as excessive maritime claims outside of the UN law of the sea. Many Southeast Asian countries, however, are very wary of phone ops for a number of reasons. First, they raise tensions with China. China has claimed that they are illegal and provocative. It argues that U.S. claims that they are trying to uphold freedom of navigation, particularly for commerce, are ill-founded. When, Chinese officials might ask, has trade ever been impeded by China? They would argue that they have no interest in interfering with commerce and will not impede it. The U.S. response is then, well, freedom of navigation is a right enshrined in international law, not a privilege to be granted by China or any one country. So there's A, this interpretation. Number two, China has protested phone ops with military means. So last October, we had this uh, incident where China sent a ship within 45 yards of a U.S. naval vessel, forcing it to really veer out of the way. There have been a number of similar incidents, both at sea and in the air. And these, of course, raise the prospect of unintended escalation, right? And once you have some kind of military encounter, trying to rein that in and prevent that from causing a wider conflict, conflict can be an extremely difficult issue, okay? Moreover, the U.S. and Southeast Asian countries have divergent interests. The U.S. is a global maritime power. It has an interest in ensuring that it can fly, sail, and operate wherever international law permits and through Southeast Asia's waterways. This interest in U.S. freedom of navigation through Southeast Asian waters is very different from the interests of Southeast Asian states in ensuring their national sovereignty to islands or shoals, or their exclusive right to exploit the resources in their EEZs. And phone ops really have not deterred China from taking Scarborough Shawl or from challenging, say, Vietni Vietnam's uh, attempts to drill for oil in its EEZ. So there's this divergence of interests of freedom through the water and the Southeast Asian interest in protecting sovereignty and exclusive rights. Um, so this is something that has, I think, hampered uh, US or Southeast Asian perceptions. We do see that there is a very large capacity building program as part of the freedom of navigation, or sorry, free and open Indo-Pacific. I want to say FOIP, but that just sounds so awful, doesn't it? Um, so we see that the U.S. has a um, 425 million Southeast Asia security initiative. This provides capacity building not only to Indonesia, but to four major maritime states. And this is actually welcomed in Southeast Asia, right? Because it enhances Southeast Asian capacity and they can use that capacity for their own purposes. We also see a whole slew of joint exercises. And in a very new development, we see the U.S. creating a new um, development finance corp, just created within the last month or two. Um, and this is capitalized with $60 billion. And for the first time, this institution is going to be able to make limited equity investments in, say, infrastructure projects in Indonesia, which are then, it hopes, will attract private sector investment. Because one of the major 
complications for the United States. Yes, it recognizes that so many Southeast Asian states have huge infrastructure needs and it would like to see those met. However, unlike China, the U.S. is a free market capitalist system. It does not have state-owned banks to provide financing or state-owned enterprises to do the investment and the work. So the creation of the international, um, or excuse me, the DFC, it's so new, I haven't got the acronym down yet, uh, the Development Finance uh, uh, Corporation, um, is really designed to uh, do this, and the head of the DFC just visited Indonesia in his first trip to the region and has committed to spend $5 billion of that $60 billion in Indonesia if the projects are, you know, sound. So I do think that we can see that this is a huge innovation and something that um, would be welcome in Southeast Asia. So what are the implications? Well, the implication, as I noted earlier, is this increasing Sino-American rivalry, right? So I'm an academic, I can tell you there is a consensus in all the literature that the safest international environment for small and medium-sized states like those in Southeast Asia is one in which there's a rough equilibrium between countries because this provides the greatest strategic autonomy for those countries to secure benefits from all States. Uh, in contrast, the most dangerous environment is one associated with the rise of great powers like China because they upset this equilibrium. And now peace and stability, they are not threatened by the rise of new powers, right? But because rising powers like China typically seek to establish a new place for themselves in the international order that they believe their new power entitles them to. This, of course, brings them into conflict with existing powers like the U.S., and it triggers the strategic competition and puts pressure on states like Southeast Asia to choose sides. So we have certainly seen rising Sino-American competition uh, escalate over the last year. Uh, we've seen President Xi abandon Deng Xiaoping, right? He had this bide your time and hide your strength doctrine. Uh, Xi has been much more assertive. He has said that China has stood up, grown rich, and become strong. Um, we've seen him use that power assertively. And clearly, President Trump has abandoned this long-standing U.S. policy of viewing China as a potential strategic partner, viewing it instead as a strategic competitor, and so you're having this pressure to choose sides, okay, um, on Southeast Asian states. So, I know that there were a lot of students that were signed up, so when we think about what strategic options might be for uh, states facing the challenge of a rising power, greater strategic um, competition, there's pretty much three, right, in the security le uh, literature. You either balance against the rising power, so you either ally with somebody or you build up your own power internally, you bandwagon or you ally with the rising China, or you try to hedge your bets and secure benefits from both sides. What factors will influence that decision? Well, if all countries are interested in preserving their core economic security and national values, then they're going to choose a strategy based on the extent to which they believe either the U.S. or China are viewed as threatening and which one is best able to help them achieve those national interests, right? So balancing is typically driven by a perception of economic or security threat not only material, but capabilities. And as you're thinking about whether or not you're gonna balance against another country, size disparities. Can Southeast Asian states balance independently against a rising China? If not, are there security partners available? Are they willing to bear the costs of balancing? Not just putting money into military resources, but uh, strategic autonomy, allying with another power, 
blood and treasure, if conflict breaks out, and also foregone opportunities, presumably with China in this case, since I've just done there. So because it's costly, we usually only see balancing when core security interests are threatened. And clearly, the only state that we've seen really balance against China was the Philippines under Aquino. Enhance the US uh, or enhance the Philippines security partnership with the US, increase military exercise, take China to uh, the UNCLOS permanent court of arbitration, and really attempt to resist China's encroachment, in part as a reaction to the takeover of Scarborough Shoal a key territorial sovereignty grab, right? So we also saw that China retaliated by the Philippines, banned a whole series of Philippine exports, didn't permit Aquino to attend a series of um, events in China, and this was done to punish the Philippines and deter other Southeast Asian countries from taking similar actions. So even though we do see the uh, Permanent Court of Arbitration ruling in favor of the Philippines in July 2016, Aquino's successor Duterte decided that the costs of balancing against China were too great, and he has instead shifted his policy. So short of balancing, we can also talk about kind of resistance to a rising power, either in the South China Sea or the BRI. Um, we certainly see Vietnam resisting against Chinese assertiveness, um, particularly against its fishing bans, um, its oil rigs, uh, et cetera, in Vietnam DEZ. We saw recently Indonesia resist um, Chinese incursions into its Natuna Island DEZs. We see Mahathir threaten um, to cancel the East Coast rail link project under China's BRI. Um, and after he threatened to cancel it, China renegotiated and dropped the cost by about a third, all right? So we do see states doing this. In terms of bandwagoning, kind of allying with the rising power to secure military or economic benefits, I think we can say that Cambodia is a clear case here. Size is a factor, right? Cambodia is so small. Geography, Cambodia and China share a border. Hun Sen's uh, decision to clamp down on uh, all of the opposition in Cambodia has really led many Western countries, particularly in the EU, to cut off um, a lot of engagement with Cambodia. Therefore, Cambodia doesn't really have a lot of the allies that it might need to take a different stance. We see that China now controls over 50% of Cambodia's coastline, and there are reports that um, Cambodia has signed an agreement for a Chinese naval base. Both sides deny it, but aerial surveillance pictures illustrate that deep water ports are being built and that airways uh, are sufficient for military aircraft. And with regard to strategic autonomy, I think we can say that Cambodia's decision in 2012, when it used its position as ASEAN chair to ensure that uh, a statement, a chairman's statement was not issued for the first time in ASEAN's 45 year period, because the Philippines pushed very hard for that statement to include a condemnation of China for the takeover of Scarborough Shoal and the Cambodians acting on behalf of Chinese interests refused to go along. Um, we see now that the decision by Cambodia to really move closer to China has had implications for ASEAN cohesion, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So third option is hedging. Hedging is obviously the preferred option, right, of all Southeast Asian states. We don't want to ally with the US. We don't want to ally with China. We want to have good relations and economic benefits from both. According to one survey of over 1,000 Southeast Asian foreign policy elites, 45% um, believe that China would become a revisionist power with the intent to turn Southeast Asia into its sphere of influence. All right? So on the one hand, this kind of perception of threat is going up. 
And yet, on the other hand, if you look at the need for a stable security partner, right, um, the same elites, 68% of them, have little confidence in the U.S. reliability as a security partner. So this combination of increasing threat perceptions of China and decreasing perceptions of the U.S as a credible security partner make it much harder to hedge, right? Yes, there are Japan, Australia, other security partners um, that they can attempt to work with. All right, so now I'm getting to Indonesia, right? What you all came from. So clearly, Indonesia faces the same trends as all of the other states. It has become a key focal point of Sino-American competition. And in part, Indonesia's status as an archipelago, right, right over some of the most strategic sea lanes of communication in the world, means it's right in the center of the Indo-Pacific. And let's not forget, this is a maritime strategy, right? Indonesia is Southeast Asia's largest state, therefore, it is best equipped to hedge, which is, of course, fully consistent with Indonesia's free and active policy. Indonesia may actually benefit from a, some of this economic competition between the U.S. and China and Japan, particularly in the investment area, as I just mentioned with the new um, Development Finance Corp. However, this Sino-American competition also challenges Southeast Asia's strategic autonomy, right? And Indonesia's key interest has traditionally been to ensure that Southeast Asia remain free from the hegemony of any outside power, great power intervention, but this is becoming much more complicated, in part because of the challenges to ASEAN cohesion and centrality. Since its creation, Indonesia has always said that ASEAN is the cornerstone of Indonesia's foreign policy, it's traditionally been a mechanism that Indonesia has used to ensure that Southeast Asia retain its strategic autonomy. So that one way that we could think about ASEAN trying to mitigate this zero-sum strategic competition would be to have ASEAN speak with one voice on critical issues. Could the group come up with a series of common platforms such as standards for BNI investment, transparency, et cetera, um, or approaches to the South China Sea, or water policy sharing for the Mekong. These are all issues that we can imagine an ASEAN coming uh, up with that would serve the benefits of all of its members. However, what we've seen is instead is that ASEAN has increasingly become divided, all right? In part, countries on mainland Southeast Asia don't want to take a position on the South China Sea that would antagonize China because they don't have a stake in it and they know China's going to retaliate. And it works the other way with the countries of maritime Southeast Asia who don't suffer the cost of dam building on the Mekong, for example. So we've actually seen ASEAN cohesion go down. Um, and we clearly see in the 2012 case, Cambodia acting in China's interest, right? Not the interests of its ASEAN partners. That makes ASEAN cohesion difficult. And the lack of ASEAN cohesion then also has negative implications for centrality, right? One of the ways that ASEAN has traditionally attempted to influence outside powers is by retaining its position as the agenda setter in regional organizations. But if ASEAN is increasingly divided, then it raises the question of whether ASEAN is going to be a bulwark against great power intervention or a venue within which great powers compete. Um, so all of these things have negative implications for Indonesia's leadership in Southeast Asia, which has traditionally been based on ASEAN. We do see, in terms of a response to the free and open Indo-Pacific, ASEAN, or sorry, Indonesia took the lead, and it created 
I don't even know how to pronounce the acronym for this, the ASEAN Outlook on the Indonesia, on the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Um, and so here, Indonesia was very successful in A, drafting a set of principles and then getting its ASEAN colleagues to agree to it, right? And the principles are, it abandoned the free aspect, right? China always interprets free when the U.S. uses it as political freedom directed against China. So the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific is for an inclusive Southeast Asia, right, that includes the U.S., China, and all of great powers that are committed to abiding by ASEAN regional norms, particularly non-intervention non in the peaceful resolution of disputes. I think the challenge now for Indonesia is to try to assess how to transform the principles within the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific into a strategy for trying to get countries to abide by them. And I think here the litmus test is going to be the negotiations over the ASEAN-China Code of Conduct in the South China Sea. They have been negotiating uh, essentially to replace the 2002 declaration on the South China Sea supposed to be um, completed within three years. Reports are that the single negotiating draft contains provisions inserted by China that compel signatories to A, um, alert uh, the other members to the COC of upcoming military exercises with outside powers and gives the signatories an opportunity to veto that. So if clauses such like that are included in the COC, then I think that we can say that this would entail a consequential loss of Southeast Asian strategic autonomy. So I've talked a lot. I just want to make a few concluding points that when we think about this, free and open Indo-Pacific is a reaction to Chinese assertiveness. It's a maritime strategy that enhances the importance of Southeast Asia to the United States. It does uh, increase Sino-American tension. Southeast Asia is a focal point of that. It increases pressure on Southeast Asian states to um, choose sides. It has negative implications for ASEAN cohesion and centrality, and it complicates India's leadership role. So I realize I've painted a very negative picture, and I'm an optimistic person by nature, so I hate to end on um, a very negative view. And so I just want to ask this question, you know, what are the prospects for the future? Can we imagine U.S. policy changing? In my interviews with um, Southeast Asian policymakers and strategic analysts, both here in Indonesia, elsewhere in Southeast Asia, I know that what S Southeast Asian st strategy um, analysts and makers want from the U.S. is a long-term strategy that takes account of the significant strategic and economic interests that the U.S. has in Southeast Asia, and that is stable over time. Now, are we going to get that under the current administration? I don't think so, right? We have a president that likes to make policy by tweet. Um, his transactional American first policy and his focus on domestic politics means that it's very reactionary to what is going to help him at home. 2020 is an election year, so I don't think we'll get that. However, if you look beyond the current administration and you look at what is coming out of some of the think tanks in Washington, there's beginning to be a lot of writing on the fact that even at the height of the U.S.-Soviet um, Cold War competition, there was a recognition that the two sides had to cooperate. They had a whole slew of common interests, and therefore we did see cooperation on a certain range of issues, and therefore it would behoove the U.S. and China to both tone down some of this kind of zero-sum rhetoric and build on those, era, those areas of cooperation. Second, there is also being an argument made 
that trying to pressure Southeast Asia to choose sides is not in the U.S. interest. After all, given the trends, particularly the economic ones, of increasing interaction between China and the U.S., that pressuring Southeast Asian states to choose sides might mean that they would choose China, given these high negative perceptions of the U.S. as a security partner. Therefore, what some analysts are beginning to argue for is that rather than pressing states to choose sides, what the U.S. should be doing is helping states to build capacity to promote their own interests in a strategically autonomous Southeast Asia that would enhance their own resilience and make them more autonomous. In my view, this is a strategy that will be welcome in Southeast Asia, and I hope it gains some traction. So since that's an optimistic point, um, I'm going to end here, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, prospects for the future, I think that's a really uh, big question mark. Um, but I, um, um, actually, I'm, I found a lot of positive, more optimistic notes in your presentation rather than, oh. <laughs> rather than um, pessimistic, particularly because um, somehow you view that Indonesia as a key focal point um, in the US-China competition, while us living here in the country, maybe we don't think so much. So um, I'll open. Um, um, uh, opportunity for some questions from the audience. Um, maybe I'll start with three. Perfect. So, uh, gentlemen in the um, back, um, the lady, and then here. Uh, I'll take three for now, and then I'll, I'll continue with another round. Can you please use the microphone um, so that everyone can hear your question? Um, and please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the chance. Uh, my name is Iqbal from Pajajaran University. Uh, I, have a three quick, uh, I have two quick questions. Uh, as we know that ASEAN and United States have a different understanding about the Indo-Pacific regional architecture, in which ASEAN perceives it to be an economic and otherwise low political cooperation, which is different from the United States perspective that centered around the context of strategic culture. So what do you think? How do, we how do we bridge this difference? And what's the focal point? And the second one. Excuse me, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm scrambling for a pen, and I missed your, okay. the first part of your question. Can okay. you start that again? OK. Uh, as we know, that ASEAN and United States have a different point of view about the uh, Indo-Pacific regional architecture, uh, in which ASEAN perceives it as the an economic and otherwise low political cooperation, uh, which is so different uh, from the United States perspective that's centered around the context of strategic culture. So how do we bridge this difference? And what's the focal point? Uh, the second one, how does the United States respond to the concept of openness and inclusiveness that promoted by ASEAN in the IOIP document, which means involving China as a dialogue partner Meanwhile, China ha has been perceived as a source of vulnerability and also threats in Donald Trump's free, open in the Pacific document. So would you ask be able to adapt to this concept? Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm TM from Media Alberta Global and from Indonesia. I would thank you for Nisan, I mean, uh, to come in here in Indonesia to explain about the political global right now here. I just want to understand about nowadays is very common in our situation about Natuna. Our very consider without one things because it in Indonesia is very conflict right now there. Exactly, it's very sad because there is going like a virus of corona and everything like that. We 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 have to place or maybe we have to understand. It's very very important for us to understand each other. My question is. Um, there is a rooted 
of very important uh, for America and U.S. I mean, for U.S. A and for China. There's a warship right now. Get it? What Indonesia have about Natuna? So, what is your conclusion and your solution for this to make our Natuna is safe from the this conflict about? And this is a deep question, exactly because we are have to know each other. If we won't have a peace of the world, how can it be? something happening right now here to get it uh, people get the benefit of course but how the solution to make everybody else feeling good thank you very much good afternoon um uh, hello professor murphy thank you so much for your presentation uh, my name is Mabda from University of Indonesia, and I have uh, a rather geographically extensive question. And my question revolves around uh, the quadrilateral security dialogue. So um, my question is, does cohesion among quad members make any difference, especially with how U.S. is uh, running its uh, FOIP strategy in ASEAN, considering that almost all uh, quad members consider uh, ASEAN as their important partner. So my question is that uh, how does cohesion among quad members make any difference, uh, be it among their uh, relations with ASEAN and also uh, within their relations among the members of the quad members themselves. So thank you so much. Thank you. So um, three questions. So one about Indo-Pacific, the differences, one about Natuna, and one about the quad that sums up pretty much everything that you wish to discuss. <laughs> Okay, um, the first question uh, was about ASEAN having a fairly economically, an economic focus and a low politics focus, if you will, and the U.S. having a much greater security one and how to bridge the differences. Um, I think this is one of those areas, and I'll repeat it again um, later, where I really don't know that we can call economics low politics anymore. Um, we live in an age where I think many people are talking about geoeconomics, right? Um, that economics can be just as critical, if not more, to promoting the national interests of key countries and therefore economic competition can be related as much to geopolitical competition, right? And I think the key issue here is how do we how do we see it, right? I mean, the the I'm being incoherent. I'm sorry because I worked really hard late last night on that talk. Um, if we say that how states use economic statecraft for security reasons, um, whether it can be coercive or co-optive, right? So is it really the case that China is engaged in using economic statecraft for security reasons, whether it is ensuring that wide runways get built along the Gulf of Thailand on strategic locations in Cambodia's case or the Hambawada port, then that is a case of using economics for security purposes, right? Um, on the other hand, you can also have a much more benign view, right, that not no great power really wants to engage in military conflict, therefore we're going to see much more economic competition in order to gain goodwill on the part of those who receive the economic benefits. And here we can think of the BRI and the FDIC and also Japan, right, using tons of economic uh, diplomacy. So I'm not convinced that there is as much of a difference that that you might make it out to be. It's not a binary, a binary view. 
Um, and then you asked about since the AIOAP is inclusive and the ASEAN members want to have dialogue over principles, you know, I think the U.S. would argue that it welcomes a debate on ideas and it welcomes a debate on what does openness mean, right? And what does rules-based mean? Um, and do we really want to see a kind of everybody agree to abide by UNCLOS norms. Yes, I know the U.S. has not signed the treaty, but its position is A, it abides by them, and B, it upholds them. And if that is something that is important for Southeast Asian countries, particularly Indonesia, right, the world's largest archipelagic state, gained its sovereignty over internal waterways through UNCLOS, and when you start talking about ideas and rules and norms, you know, I, I would think that in this case, U.S. diplomats would very much welcome a discussion of that and welcome a discussion of that with China in the room. So I don't think that would be a source of conflict with, with the U.S., all right? Um, Regarding the question over Natuna, um, how to protect Natuna, boy, <laughs> if I had those ideas, the Indonesian government would want me very much. I mean, I think, I think you can look, you know, the, the policy makers have adopted a whole slew of different policies, right? Greater uh, investment in maritime domain uh, surveillance capacities, so you know when ships are there, you can detect foreign vessels, greater investment in both the Coast Guard, right, the creation of Bakamla to try to coordinate that. Um, you know, you've had a debate about whether Ibu Susi's blow up the boats policy was successful in deterring. And so here, you know, if we're really talking about fish, you know, how do you protect resources and how do you build up a capacity for Indonesian fishermen to exploit Indonesia's Natuna Island DEZ because if there's enough of them there, there's not going to be so much room for Chinese boats, right? Um, so I think that's all part of it. Um, with regard to overcoming differences and helping to promote world peace, I'm here as a Fulbright scholar. People-to-people -people exchange is a wonderful thing. A lot of the Fulbright folks are there, so I would advise uh, academic exchanges as a solution to that. Um, with regard to Magda's question regarding the Quad, um, you know, the Quad is really a dialogue. Um, yeah, you have a couple of exercises between the U.S. and India, the Malbar exercises, U.S. Japan, you know, U.S. Australia. If you look at, have you really had military exercises between the four members? It's virtually non-existent. Um, so I think that the fear of these countries kind of coming in is over drawn. And I think this also provides an opportunity, right, for ASEAN to say, well, if you're so concerned about these things, you know, let's all hammer out certain rules of engagement and how we can all work towards that kind of rules-based order and ASEAN interests within that. So I don't think it's necessarily an antithetical um, group ASEAN. Okay, so a second round of questions. So I, I just have a question. So one here. I get one on the outside. I'm happy that someone from the outside can actually hear us. Um, another one. Okay, the lady in the front. So, sir, please, can you use one of the microphones again? You have to use one of the, yeah, there's only two in the room. Thank you. I'm just have one question short. 
since you mentioned that for Indonesia there is an increase according to the U.S. Department of State is like 25 percent the AIDS five billions. If you can more elaborate on that for Indonesia, because because in because in ASEAN is uh, you know how do I find out that I information also because in ASEAN they say like 4.5 billion to to you know Asian. Southeast Asia, and then during the Trump, you know, administrations, they are going to increase by 25 percent for Indonesia. And what what will be entailed broadly? That is it because during the Trump ad administration, is like oil is one of the number one priority. Also, is that including Southeast Asia? Also. Can you come in and use the mic here? Thank you. Uh, my name is Kaptari from the Raven Hill Analytics. So uh, as, w as we can see like from past four years that the India has kept increasing their own particip their particip participation and ambitions to um, to include themselves in the um, in the in the FOIP, in the FOIP and also ASEAN. Um, and also there are several discussions that uh, that the Indian MOFA in the MOFA try to include themselves in uh, to create a new mechanism of dialogue between Indonesia and Australia in the form of um, triad um, for Indo-Pacific triad. So yeah, uh, so from the perspective, is it going to solve uh, the ASEAN's, uh, ASEAN's appeasement and new directions for a sense of resolution in in uh, Indo-Pacific? Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Natalia. I'm from Russian Mission to ASEAN. Um, thank you very much for the lecture. We actually share a lot of ideas you expressed today. But uh, there is one painful topic, and I just want to know your expert opinion on it. You mentioned several times the rules-based order or rules-based something. How could you, well, as an expert, explain who defines these rules? Because it's it's a really well critical issue for us, and that's the thing that we still don't understand. Mm -hmm. what, what would you comment on it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Murphy. Okay. Uh, first question on the issue of um, the aid. So that five billion that I mentioned, that is not economic aid that would be a commitment from the Development Finance Corporation as an equity investment as part of a much bigger project financing that had significant private sector participation. So, for example, if there were a huge bridge or port that Indonesia wanted built, American investors traditionally look at Indonesia and they get a little concerned about legal certainty, they get concerned about regulatory certainty, et cetera. And so the U.S. in the past has had what we called the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which would guarantee uh, a, a certain portion of their investments. And the goal here, again, is that Indonesia, or sorry, the U.S. as a capitalist economy wanted to see private sector rather than state investments. The U.S. does not have, as I indicated, state-owned banks or state-owned corporations. So what can the government do to try to entice American companies to invest? So. There is, it, this is a new mechanism, it's completely untried, but I think it's significant that the head of the Development Finance Corp, first visit, it was just founded in December, right? He came and he went to Japan because the U.S. is hoping to partner a lot of these projects with Japan, Australia, China, other countries. Um, and then he came here to listen to Indonesian officials, find out what investments they thought this might be useful for and what American companies could help with. So 
If I gave the impression that this is aid, it is not. But 5% of 60 is a significant portion, and I do think it demonstrates the recognition of Indonesia's importance. Whether or not this will materialize, these kinds of negotiations over large projects that involve not just the U.S. Indonesian governments, but private companies uh, across a range of different uh, companies or different countries, I apologize, um, those are very complicated. So it's going to be interesting to see how this works out, okay? Um, in terms of India playing a larger role, I'm not sure about that. Um, you know, I keep reading in the press, India, Indonesia, you know, the world's soon to be first and fourth most popular countries and their democracies and they're developing and gee, they're right next to one another in the alphabet and there should be so much more cooperation between the two. And then when I actually interview people, I hear that there's really not a lot of interest in or appetite for a lot of cooperation, that economic ties are not as robust as they could be, um, that there is a disinclination on the part of many ASEAN countries sometimes for the way in which India chooses to assert itself. So for example, India really wanted to be part of um, the, uh, what is it, the Gulf, the joint exercises, the Malacca Straits Patrol, um, arguing that, well, you know, the Indian Ocean kind of comes up there. You know, it's not a literal state. They didn't really want them in. So I don't necessarily think that you will see significant um, maritime security cooperation, even though I know there's been a lot of press. Um, I could be wrong, but that's my sense. Um, with regard to this issue of who writes the rules, um, you're absolutely correct, right? This notion of a rules-based order is something that people in Washington talk about a lot, and I used it as well um, significantly here. And this question of who writes the rules is huge, right? Usually, if we read all of our IR literature, it's, gee, the ones with the power get to write the rules, right? So yeah, we can talk about a global liberal order, but that came out of World War II, Bretton Woods, the victors, right? The US, um, Great Britain, et cetera. I think um, the US response would be that there is a recognition that things need to change. Um, and I think there is a willingness, perhaps not in the UN, nobody wants to give up their uh, veto power in the UN Security Council. But I actually think that this is one of the cases where um, there is a strong desire on the part of the US, particularly in Southeast Asia, to work with ASEAN. Um, and particularly Indonesia, right? If you look at around the world and you look at all the literature, which countries benefit most from international laws? It's middle powers. If we look around and we say, where does international law you know, come from? Who are the strongest proponents? You know, it's countries like Holland, right, that needed it out of maritime law. It's usually these kind of smaller middle states that have enough authority and capacity to play that diplomatic role, articulate a vision, look at what Indonesia did during the whole negotiations over UN Law of the Sea. They developed that archipelagic principle. They got it enshrined in international law. So I do think that there is a recognition among parts of the US policy establishment and government. I think we saw it under Obama, um, a very much trying to work with multilateral organizations, sign a lot of agreements, whether it be the Paris Climate Accord, the Iran nuclear deal, these notions that 
multilateral agreements can solve intractable issues. That is not evident under the Trump administration. And so, again, I don't want to just talk about kind of one American view. There's lots of American views, and the question is, who's making policy? Okay, we still have time for one more round, if there's any question. No? <laughs> okay, um, if there's no question, um, could I just ask you to um, sort of like elaborate one more issue? Um, you mentioned plenty of times about pressure to choose sides. Um, when the um, ASEAN outlook, um, the first initiative coming from Indonesia, I think the, one of the basics um, of that was that Indonesia wants to eliminate such pressure from Southeast Asia. There is a need to keep this region stable, um, neutral, quote unquote, from um, you know um, um, heavily reliance on one side. Uh, but then you say the AOIP is the AOIP. You know, um, if you look at the current condition, it has not really succeeded because you don't. In, in terms of eliminating the pressure, because you don't really see any changes in terms of the state's behavior. You know, those leaning to, towards China continues to lean towards China. Those leaning towards the U.S. continues to lean towards the U.S. But then you mentioned, you know, there is the, the need for the ASEAN outlook now is actually to create the strategy to implement some of the things that are mentioned um, um, in the outlook. Um, again, back to being optimistic and or pessimistic, um, should we ever come to this accomplishment of creating such strategy, do you think Indonesia's intention of eliminating such pressure would be successful? When she said there were no more questions, I thought I was going to get to have coffee and some of those nice cakes out there. Um, boy, that's a tough one, right? I mean, I guess the question is what the strategy would be, right? <sighs> Choosing sides is a kind of old-fashioned, very realist kind of military term, right? And so part of it is, you know, who's making policy and to what extent do they see the world in those terms? And if you look at the profiles of say the policy makers in the Obama versus the Trump administrations, you saw a lot more civilians, a lot more intellectuals. You know, you saw people as Secretary of State like John Kerry, a Vietnam War veteran, who had learned the lesson that, you know, <laughs> you really don't want to do that again and therefore you need to really employ diplomatic mechanism. The question is, and, and you see a very different profile, right? Lots of generals and others under Trump. Once you have these mechanisms, how do you get other countries to abide by them, right? So much of international politics is writing beautiful conventions on, you know, human rights or other things, and then how do you ensure compliance with them? So. I'm not answering your question because I don't have a good answer. And I think what the U.S. would say is if there was this agreement on a set of principles that involve non-use of force, peaceful settlement of disputes, the U.S. would be very happy to see that and to support that. The question is, how do you deal with non-compliance, right? That's the big issue. And people haven't figured that one out yet, right? What do you do when a state signs a treaty like UNCLOS and then, you know, doesn't abide by it? That's a huge <laughs> challenge. And I don't have the answer to world peace, so my apologies. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Murphy. Um, like I mentioned in the very beginning, it's been a pleasure hosting you at CSIS, and you know, um, a very um, a thank you that you um, agreed to giving this uh, lecture today, uh, and also thank you to everyone who um, attend um, this lecture.
Um, so please keep in mind that we um, regularly host this, this uh, lecture series on regional dynamics. So if you put your email uh, at the registration desk, uh, be sure to uh, get the invitations for the next ones to come. So we look forward also to welcoming you to, to CSIS again next time. So thank you and have a very good afternoon.